I was saying that uh, Ditti is very important in, uh, in Buddhism. And, but Ditti is just what it is. It is a view. It is a perspective. It is not the actual reality yet. All of us are born in this world with eyes and ears to hear and see. But we are not always uh, able to transcend those uh, visual and auditive experiences to attain the inner experience, inner knowledge, inner wisdom that the Buddha attained. So we still need to rely on observation. And even faith in Buddhism, as I mentioned in the previous, uh, the previous uh, time we met, is not exactly the same as faith in uh, our uh, Western Judeo-Christian Judeo tradition that we think of faith as something that is uh, really like a leap without any knowledge. You really believe in something, you give it a, your full attention and everything. But in Buddhism, faith and wisdom always go together. You need a bit of wisdom and you need the leap of faith. Some things we cannot see and hear, but we have certain views on what things might, might be like. And those views inspire us to do good. To, they, we feel motivated to do good, to lead a positive and realistic life. And that is uh, what we call right view. Mm -hmm. So there's some uh, comparisons used in the text uh, about right view. Uh, one of them is uh, the, the I, I mentioned it previously. Uh, let me just start the presentation in the meantime. Yes, it's there. Okay. And uh, one uh, symbol or metaphor that I mentioned before is that um, right view is like the first, the first beams of light coming through in the morning, the morning light, that, that we are aware that this is the beginning of the sun that is about to rise. And the first beams of light that wake us up in the morning or maybe when we are waking up very early, we can see the sun rising. The first beams of light that tell us, oh, okay, the sun is coming. And the same way right view is, is an indication that we are on the path being a good, a inner, inner beautiful person with inner beauty and character, good character. But for that, you need a certain perspective of life, which is not cynical. It's positive, but realist at the same time. And that is what we call right view. Ah, we already had this, and, and right view is very similar to moral reasoning. Uh, moral reasoning in psychology, it's just about the ability and commitment and persistence to do good, to make moral decisions. We talked about the importance of giving, uh, giving, sacrifice, helping out others, and even respecting those who are worthy of respect, those who are uh, worthy of recognition, mm. those around us that we think we can learn a lot from. We should respect them, we should show our respect, not only know it, so we can learn from these people. That not only involves uh, Buddhists, uh, monks, or something like that. It is not only, it's not even only about clergy, religious people. It's about any people in general who we respect and who we can learn from spiritually and ethically. And these were, this is what we call there is offering. With the word there is offering, the Buddha meant it's good to show your respect, your recognition for people who are more virtuous or have better character than us. We can learn from them and we should recognize that the differences between people. Some people say, well, everyone is the same, isn't it? We're all the same in the law, but that's not the same as being, that's not the same as saying that everyone is exactly the same. We are different. Even if you go back, to you alive as a child when you were still very young, you can remember that there were many things which you had not learned yet, which you have now learned. So why wouldn't it be possible for people around us to know more than us? 
and we can learn from other people like that by recognizing that. Then we talked about the law of karma and we were got kind of, uh, we're, we're stuck at that point. <laughs> Not stuck, but <laughs> we kind of, uh, uh, we were uh, discussing that. We talked about that learning about the law of karma can create sometimes some fear, but it, fear is not always an enemy. Sometimes it's good to have certain fears that are reasonable, like uh, uh, fear because you want to do good. You, you don't want to, to lose your principles in doing good. And you want not to want, don't want to lose your principles in avoiding wrong. You don't want to, you cause suffering to yourself and others and that there is a certain recognition of that danger and so you you're careful with that so when people ask me uh, you just just a moment uh, i think somebody was trying to ask a question but just a moment uh, i was just saying that even though uh, this is not exactly the fear that we usually associate when we talk about teaching about uh, uh, doing good as we some people associate with religion is actually not that kind of irrational fear it's about a fear that is based that is just you know we always have certain things that we fear we do not need there's a lot of things we do we don't need to fear we can we can let those fears go but sometimes there's a certain sense of uh, being careful being uh, ashamed that you don't, you know, certain things that you won't do, certain things which you recognize that are not good. Then on the other side of the specter of the spectrum, there's the courage to do good. And I think last time we ended with the idea that there is also faith for that. Faith in Buddhism is the confidence that your actions will always have consequences. Every deed is important. So, in our lives, we do not always know where our actions lead to. Like you can see in this long, what do you call this in English? <laughs> a, not a bridge, but what is it called? A pier? Pier. Is that a pier? A pier? Yeah. Pier, yeah. Pier or pier? Pier. Pier. It, it, it might, yeah. it, another word might be jetty. A jetty. Is, is that, is that Eng British English? Or is that used <laughs> in America as well? Yeah. No, <laughs> it, it's pure. <laughs> it's okay, pure. okay, we have some difference here. You need to fight, pure, pure, fight it out. Pure, okay, <laughs> pure sounds right. Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, we are try to try to speak some transatlantic English today. <laughs> um, so um, every uh, every deed that we do is important. We do not always know the end. Uh, of every deed, the, the, the results of all the things we do. But Buddhism kind of teaches that based on observation and our wisdom, we can take a leap of faith and know that when we do good, even when no one sees it in the world, even if no one is aware of it, uh, but you are aware, you are your own witness, and that goodness will bring good results in your life. This is the faith to, that you are willing to take risk, take a leap of faith to do good in your life. It is also associated in Buddhism, faith is also associated in Buddhism with the idea that uh, enlightenment is real, that there are really Buddhists. But we'll get back to that point later because we are now talking about the fourth part of right view and uh, the, 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 the letter, the, 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 the in a, in a later part of this series, we go back to the idea of what it is to be a Buddha, what it means for somebody to become a Buddha. That's a, a bit of a different topic. So I also mentioned the story about the air hostess. Did you remember? Yeah. Vesna Vilovic. Did somebody look her up? Vesna Vilovic. <laughs> or may, maybe difficult to spell, huh? <laughs> She's the only one that survived yeah. the toilet overhead and the airplane. <laughs> yeah, she, she was actually a um, very lucky person, if you remember from my story. And it, it always leads you to the question, why do some people are so lucky? Why do always do these things kind of things happen? 
not so long ago, there was a, a documentary and I'm a, I'm a bit of a, um, a person who likes to watch documentaries that give you good knowledge. And uh, this was a documentary about, uh, in America, not so long ago, about three uh, twins, about three twins that actually were uh, discovered at, when they were already adults, young adults, that they were twins and that were three of them and that they were, they were all adopted and they were ended up in different families and then they met each other later on. And then they later, they, they figured a lot of things out about their lives, which was very similar. This kind of things makes you wonder, <laughs> there's so much we don't know about human life. Right? Science can give you many answers. They can, science can tell you how many vitamins there are in your meal. Science can tell you what happens to your body when you eat this or that. But science cannot even answer some very basic questions about life. Why do we die? Science cannot answer that yet. Even physically, they cannot explain it. Why do we sleep? Science does not have a satisfactory answer yet, scientifically speaking. Why do we dream? Science cannot explain yet. They cannot even explain why we sneeze, <laughs> for goodness sake. So, so uh, science is not, does not have all the answers yet. And there are many basic things that science cannot answer yet. We almost know more about the universe around us than we know about ourselves. And that is the very nature of human beings. So uh, karma is a law, just like there are laws in physics, biology, psychology. According to Buddhism, there is also a moral causality which has to do with our mind. It exists in this world. We attract certain things in our lives according to what we do. And we attract certain things in kind that means we attract the same things that we do. Similar things, let me put it that way. So when we do something good, then happiness will tend to follow us. Just like the shadow that gives coolness follows you around when you walk somewhere. And when we do something with an ill-directed mind or with a, with a bad intention, and then we create suffering, we also attract suffering accordingly. This is the law of karma in a nutshell. Uh, the traditional comparison is like a cart which is drawn by an animal and wherever the animal will go, like a horse for example, it will attract, it will draw that cart in that direction. And the, the cart will never leave the animal. In the same way, the deeds that we do will always follow us around. Not always, but a long time. Because even karma has a point of exhaustion. When the karmas that we have done no longer affect us. When certain karmas no longer affect us. But because we do karmas all the time, we do karma all the time, there will usually always be karma in our lives and the results of those karma. The karma that we do the things that we do, we say, we think, we call that karma or kama in Pali language. And the result of it we call vipaka or in Thai language, vipakam. Uh, pala is also a similar word. But in the West we use karma with an R as you can find it in perfume and in fashion. <laughs> so um, it, we, I will use karma with an R so it's easily understood. Karma not only uh, is something that ripens in the here and now, it affects our current life, the things that we do and have done. It also carries over in the next life, according to Buddhism. And it even carries over in subsequent lives. So there's this book that I mentioned to you before called Cloud Atlas, and it actually describes the law of karma very well. It says that everything we do, every small little, uh, I can't remember the exact wording, but something like every small evil that we do will affect our future lives like wrinkles in the water. And will affect our future like that. There's a lot of misunderstandings in the West about what it means to have karma and what it means to have future lives. So there's a lot we can talk about here. 
some things I suppose you have learned about already. This, uh, I think this cartoonist misunderstands. <laughs> and thus, as my last will and testament, I leave all of my belongings to myself in the next life. So this is an example of what uh, next life is not, and karma is not. What is karma? Karma will always ripen for the doer, not for anyone else. The karma that has been done will ripen, oh, sorry, will ripen as soon as it obtains an opportunity. That means that sometimes it can happen that certain karma that we have done just haven't ripened yet. They haven't had an effect in our lives yet. So it may be, for example, that you've done a lot of good in your life, but you find you still have a lot of hardship in your life, adverse, adversities. That is because sometimes the good deeds that we have done have not had an opportunity to ripen yet. And the thing is with having an opportunity that also we attract things in kind. So even the good deeds that we've done in the past will ripen quicker if we do more good. And the bad things that we've done will tend to ripen quicker if we do more bad. Now I know I'm being a bit simplistic saying good and bad. The words that the Buddha often used are wholesome and unwholesome but it comes down to the same thing, which is whether we are motivated by greed, hatred, or delusion, or whether we are not motivated by those, but motivated by opposites like generosity, or uh, kindness, or uh, wisdom. So I already discussed that to uh, quite a long extent, so I, I will not go back to that point, but that is what I mean by good and bad. So a karma that has been done will ripen as soon as it obtains an opportunity. So it may, uh, you may um, sometimes have heard that even in Buddhism, there is a sense of if you have some bad karma from the past, there is a way that you, you cannot avoid it. You can never run away from your karma, but you can dilute it. Do I pronounce that correctly? Dilute. <laughs> I mean, like you, you put something in water. Now let me make a comparison. It's just like you put salt in a glass of water. You know that water will be very salty. You don't want to drink it, right? But if you put the same pinch of salt in a river, you, you can easily drink from that river because the, water, the, the salt will be mixed with a lot of water. In the same way, if we have done the same exact, exactly the same bad deed in the past, it may still affect us uh, in the present, but it will affect us less if we have more good deeds. This is how the law of karma works. And the opposite thing around, the, up, the, up, the opposite as well, the other way around. So if we have uh, done a lot of good deeds, uh, those good deeds will affect us less if in the present moment we make many mistakes and we do many things that are bad and create, create suffering. So in other words, the karma must always ripen. You cannot flee from, flee from it and you cannot cause it. It will always ripen for you. You know, one person said to me, well, I think I mentioned this before, the one person told me that karma is about uh, like you can kill a, a mouse because that mouse, it's his karma to be killed. That is not exactly what the law of karma is. The law of karma is always about what you do is not about what, <laughs> what will happen to others. Yeah. Yeah. There's also this, uh, um, okay, just go back for a moment. So in, our, in, uh, in another way to, stay, to say it is that karma is never blame it on your past karma. You don't blame it everything on your past karma because you can change things. It's also, and I'm sorry to say this, but this is actually literally in the Buddhist text, blame it on God's will. And that's also not uh, uh, the law of karma, okay? And it's, uh, and also blame it on destiny. That's, that's not the law of karma. So these are things, things which are not the law of karma, okay? So we cannot blame our suffering uh, on, on a past karma, blame it on God or blame it on destiny. These things we can change. We cannot, uh, 
give the responsibility for our lives to something else or somebody else. There's a story about this. Um, I don't want to be offensive, but it's just a story as a comparison, as a, as a sort of a metaphor, okay? So don't, don't be offended by it. It's just to make a point. It's not offending any religion. This story is about a woman who has been, uh, who's living in a village that is flooded. There's a big flood coming and her entire house, just like all the other villagers, is completely covered with water, is completely flooded. And the water is all the way, is, is very, is, is like all the way until here. And, and she can hardly su survive because she cannot swim. And then a boat comes and they say to her, you should come along before you will drown. Come along with us, we can save you. And then she says, no, I don't have to. Why, why not? Why not? You can come along, there's enough space in the boat. And then she says, I don't have to because God will help me. And then she doesn't go to the boat. She doesn't go on the boat. And then the water continues to go up and she's like, oh, and then the next boat comes. And there's also some villagers in there and they love her very much. They want her to, to be saved, but she says, no, God will help me. And then the water goes up and then she's almost drowned. And then a third boat comes. And they ask the same thing, but she still refuses help. And then she finally drowns. And the story goes that she goes to heaven and then she meets God. And then she says to him, why didn't you help me? And he says, well, I did a lot of effort. I sent three boats to you and you didn't go on one of those boats. <laughs> so this story shows that uh, there's a lot of things we don't know about our lives and about what is destiny, what is God's will or what is karma. But one thing is for sure, we know that uh, everything we do will affect us and uh, we have a freedom to make choices. So again, I'm sorry if that offended anyone, but uh, uh, it's just making a point about, uh, it's a philosoph philosophical point. So these are some examples that are mentioned in Buddhist texts about the working of the law of karma. So I'm going to through a few, a few just to give you some idea. So according to Buddhism, when you have killed living beings or you're killing living beings in the present moment, you have a short life. When you give up doing so and you start to do good positive things like saving people's lives or helping people, then you have a long life. I'm sorry about the sometimes the, the grammar not being good because it was copied from something else and therefore the spaces are sometimes bad. The spacing is sometimes not correct. Injuring beings is actually uh, causing somebody suffering, but not to the extent that he or she dies. That causes sickness. You, are not, you don't die, but you, are, you have problems with sickness. Even if you kill insects or you hurt insects, something like that, then it will still affect your health to some extent. Not doing so, refraining from that gives you health. These are some examples that are mentioned in the Buddhist text. Being angry leads you to ugliness. <laughs> this is something that's easier to imagine. Not being angry leads you to beauty. Not being angry in here means also to be kind and loving. Okay? So, these are some examples and you might notice they're very specific and very concrete. And we sometimes might wonder if they're very specific, concrete uh, mechanics of karma in our lives like that. Do these things really exist? And the, the answer is, well, there are certain patterns in life. There are certain pattern, patterns in life. If you look at the birds that fly in the sky, they can make a perfect V, v shape, right? They can, they can take all sorts of perfectly perfect shapes when they go somewhere. And they haven't been trained in that. They, have, they are do that by nature. There's a lot of patterns, there's a lot of 
regularities in nature. And the law of karma is also part of nature, part of the way life works. There are certain patterns in it, certain regularities. These are some other examples. These are all from the same text, actually. Envious, being somebody who's envious might lead you to have little influence in your life. You might be the sort of person that will never end up in a good position. There will always be people who will vote against your promotion. <laughs> this can happen. <laughs> Not being envious, being, on the other hand, being supportive of other people's success, what we sometimes call sympathetic joy. Being supportive, like the sort of good for you mentality that we, uh, that we have. Huh? And that leads to influence. It leads you to a position where you can affect other people positively and people will listen to you because you have not been envious to their success, about their success. Uh, not giving to clergy, this is also mentioned in the text, leads to poverty. This is actually in general about not giving. If you never give, you will not be given. This is also a general idea uh, in, in Buddhism. So, and I know some people will say, well, it's not always poss possible for everyone to give, right? That may be true, but don't be surprised if some of the most poorest people sometimes are the most generous. <laughs> this is um, sort of, um, my grandmother, she used to, uh, she used to work in uh, charity a lot. She has already passed away, but um, she always used to say that, uh, unfortunately, generosity is more often practiced by, by the poor than by the rich. <laughs> And she even added a little bit cynically, I might say that there's a reason why rich people get rich. <laughs> I think that is not a complete picture, but um, it's uh, true that uh, we often, when we already have a good life, we sometimes forget about the other person <laughs> and generosity becomes less uh, often practiced. So it's very common when you go, when you live in Thailand, like I did for eight years in Thailand, and you go for alms round, that means you go along the houses to ask for your morning meal. You don't actually ask, you just go along the houses. You walk and you have an alms bowl. I'm sure you have seen the picture often in your center. You've seen it often. But this is actually in Thailand, you go along the houses. Uh, you don't, you go along in the city, you go along the streets. You don't uh, walk in circles <laughs> inside your, meditation center, that's not the general practice. And that's why when you do that, uh, you will notice that villages or neighborhoods that are uh, very rich, they don't give much. It's a very, very noticeable. I don't know why. <laughs> so you get there and there's, a, I was used to go there with one friend of mine and, um, and um, he was, he was telling me, this is a neighborhood that, that doesn't give much. And I, I could see that it looked like a sort of Beverly Hills. It was very, very big houses everywhere. But my fellow monk, my, my fellow monk, he knew one house that would give. But we had to ring the doorbell. <laughs> and then a lot of dogs came out. <laughs> and then there was one older woman who was raised with very good values and principles. And she came to give to us. And then we went away and that was it, <laughs> one house. Then to be honest, to be fair, some people are very poor, they cannot give. So I usually found that middle, middle halfway between poor and rich, they used to give the most. You could easily get a morning meal from these people. Um, but it's also, of course, rather difficult for some person like me to go to a poor village and to get food from very poor people, that, that's another issue. So uh, it's not that the law of karma says that uh, uh, poor people are wrong or something. It's simply a sort of nature of life. We tend to uh, 
become rich at a certain point maybe, and then we forget about giving and then we become poor, we go ups and downs. There's ups and downs. But when we know about the importance of giving and that giving helps us in life, then we tend to be more careful about this and we will always try to have generosity of part of our lives. And that is uh, why this says here, not giving to clergy and giving to them. So uh, in the time of the Buddha, it was already a common practice to give to religious uh, people. So there is also the aspect of being arrogant, birth in a low class family and being respectful, birth in a high class family. So when you are always looking down on others, then you tend to become the way you look at others. And when you're always respectful, you see others as, as uh, you look at the good things of others, other people, and you recognize the good qualities in other people that are there. Of course, you're not making them up, but they're, they're really there. Then you try to learn from those people who you can learn from, wise people on your path. Then you tend to be born in a high class family. And then there is the tendency to ask questions, to see uh, wise people on your path and to ask them questions. Not asking leads to lack of wisdom, asking leads to wisdom. These are some examples. Oh, sorry. Um, Venerable Sander, yes. I have a I question. Take a moment. Can we ask questions? Yeah, sure. Okay, um, so I am very curious because um, when someone is fortunate and, you know, a lot of times people who are fortunate in the world and they're born with a lot of wealth, to me, yes. obviously that wealth comes from their generosity from previous existence exactly. that they're not rooted in them. And right. then, you know, say someone who's born in an unfortunate um, status and, you know, in a village where there's not a lot of money um, that, they, that they have to give is because they didn't give before. So it's very interesting that for me, I feel like people who are wealthy already have it in, ingrained in them to be generous. That's why they are where they're at. So therefore, isn't it much easier for them to want to give because that's who they are inside naturally? For example, like someone like Bill Gates or even Warren Buffett, who has so much yes. money because of obviously previous existence of cultivation of good deeds, to me, there's that correlation that of course they're going to be giving because that's who they are ingrained inside. So naturally they want to give because deep down subconsciously, they've always done that. So that's kind of my rationale. And it's a little, it's interesting that I, I've experienced that too. Like a lot of wealthy people don't seem to be at that point when you would expect them to just because of that's who they are at their core deep down, but yet the majority of them aren't like that. Yes, I, 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 didn't, I didn't mention yet that my grandmother was actually quite wealthy. <laughs> so so it, there are always exceptions. The general rule is, however, that the more comfortable we are, the more we forget about doing good. And that's why it's important to have good principles in life. Because when we do good, we cannot, it's hard to do good when we are only facing hardship in life. But it's easy to forget when we, to do good when we only have comfort in life. But of course, you don't want to create suffering in your life, so you tend to reach for more comfort. So the Buddha would teach that it's not bad to try to find more comfort and security in life, financially or otherwise. But we also need to continue to reflect on that those finances, that money, that security, that comfort is impermanent and it depends on what you do now. So the reason why some people are arrogant and some people are humble because they are aware of this. They are aware that everything they have gained in life is dependent on what they have done now and what, I'm uh, sorry, what they have done in the past and what, and whether they have that in the future, those good things will depend on what they do now. 
if you think of all the good things that you've had, think about your, your education. Did you have a college education? Did you go to university? Think about your economic situation where you raised wealthy or just poor or poor. Uh, were you raised in comfortable conditions or not? All those things have affected your life. Some of those things might have created certain views in life that caused you to look down on others. I know for my part, this is very easy to affect you in life. When you look at somebody and you see they're poor or not intelligent, then you start to look down on them. Why don't they study harder? Why don't they work harder? And then you become arrogant. This can really easily happen in our lives. So that's why the Buddha always said, everything that happens that is good in life, is not wrong to avoid uh, wealth. It's, it's, it's not, uh, sorry. It's not necessary to avoid wealth. It's good to be financially secure and happy and comfortable, but we also uh, need to be aware that those things, they are not permanent. And when I say they are impermanent, that means they can change, they can disappear, and they are dependent on causes and conditions. That is always the case in Buddhism. Everything in life, is impermanent, it can change, it can disappear, it can disappear from our lives. And that is because it's dependent on causes and conditions. So if we think about it in this way, then we will not become arrogant and we will never forget about being a good person. So fortunately, there are also many rich people, many famous people, and also many wise and intelligent people who have used the, all the things that they've had in life, all the knowledge, the wealth, and the position they had for good things rather than bad things. They may be a minority, but they are there. Those good people are always have been there since the time of the Buddha up till today. And they will always be there. But uh, whether we are not uh, misled by our own comfort, wealth and intelligence depends on whether we are reflective about those things. But in terms of the law of karma, the Buddha always would say to strive for more comfort and security in life so you can easily do good. And when we have more, we can easily give more. When we have more intelligence, we can also give more knowledge. If we have more knowledge, we can give more knowledge. That's right, right? Uh, but uh, and we have a better position, position, then we can also affect more people to do good, right? So all of these things are not bad in themselves. But if we abuse them, if we don't use them in the right way, then they become a danger in our lives. Am I making any sense here? <laughs> oh, yeah. Very. Thank you. That okay. totally answered my question. It has? Okay.